thank you everyone so much for coming to our second ever hybrid brain club where we are here on the Vermont State House lawn um, and with you on Zoom. And uh, today I am thrilled to introduce our guest presenter, Matt Mulligan, who is officially now on our board of directors here at All Brains Belong Vermont. Um, and um, do you do you like want me to talk about your background, or you want to talk about your own background? What do you want to do? You can say what you know. Okay, I can say what I know. Um, Matt um, is one of the coolest people I've ever met, um, and <laughs> um, and. <laughs> Right. Um, I also forgot to introduce myself because there actually are some people on our call who I've not met yet. I'm Mel Hauser. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director here at All Brains Belong, Vermont. Anyway, Matt is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Um, and, oh, hi. Um, and um, is a mental health therapist and a... Um, a, a has a really important set of life experiences that has informed his perspective on the environments that contribute to self-actualization. And um, what we are uh, going to have the opportunity to hear from Matt about today is a book that he wrote about um, a, a, about this theme, and then I'm sure we will have our, our, what will be a really important conversation um, with some panelists and and discussion from participants. So Matt, I'm gonna pass this to you, and you're gonna move to the picnic table. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna read the book. I've never done anything like this before, so watch me practice. <laughs> We're all practicing every day. Uh, oh, there I am. Okay, so this, let's see. Um, wonder about, yeah. Um, so, I would like to read my book, and then I want to entertain questions. Um, how are we going to, will, we, will you see the questions? So, yeah, so I'll be monitoring the chat, and I can read out questions as okay. they come in. Um, or kind of once you're done reading. And, yeah. Um, it's a um, it's a very short book, <laughs> so um, I won't be reading. Um, this book. Oh, <laughs> this this book is called uh, Tomatoes and Peppers. Um, it's inspired by an idea that popped into my head while I was driving to my internship about uh, ooh, seven years ago. Um, this book would not exist in any way without uh, my best friend of many years, Sonia Spaulding. Um, she was the project manager and um, uh, basically made this book happen. So, um, you know, a good um, example of partnerships where people have different skill sets and work together to make things happen. And I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, Chen Fake was is the illustrator of this book um, originally from uh, Beijing uh, she lives here in central Vermont with her family and um, sh her art added just the right uh, touch to the book so I'm grateful for her contribution as well um, and now I'm gonna read the book so uh, tomatoes and peppers a metaphorical tale for anyone who cares about kids Um, the dedication, I'll read that too, to my mom and to Sonia, who both played a huge part in the growth of this tomato. Spring has arrived, and it's time to plant your garden. You go to the nursery, and you pick out two seedlings, a tomato plant and a pepper plant. You plant them in good soil in a spot that will get lots of sun. You keep a watering can nearby in case they need extra water. You find a trowel to dig up any weeds that may pop up along the way. Then your work is done. Then you remember that you need a cage for the tomato plant. Even though it's a seedling, you can place the cage now to 
give it extra support it needs as it grows. Pepper plants don't need the extra support. Their limbs are stronger and their fruit is lighter. You might need to stake it and then it will do fine. Tomato plants, however, have skinnier limbs and heavier fruit. And so, without the right support, the tomatoes will bend or even break the plant. They might grow in the dirt and spoil. We provide different supports for each plant without a second thought. Do we blame the tomato because it needs extra support to produce good fruit? Nope. Do we question the character of the tomato plant because it needs more support as it grows? Nope. Do we believe that there's something wrong with the tomato plant because it struggles to carry its heavier load? Nope. Do we believe that there's something wrong with the tomato because it weighs the plant down? Nope. We don't criticize the tomato plant for not being able to carry the load, and we don't criticize the tomato for being too heavy. We simply anticipate the need based on what we know about the tomato and the plant and understand that if they end up in the dirt, we are to blame. We do not label it as different in some way, and we do not blame the seed it grew from. We don't blame the seed, we don't wait for the motorcycle. We don't blame the ground in which the seed grew. We simply give it the support it needs. On the counter in the kitchen, you see a pepper and a tomato. You don't think twice about how they got there fully grown. Their seedlings have the same potential with differing outcomes and different needs for support. Our communities are filled with seedlings that become tomatoes and peppers. Why can't we care for our children the way we care for these plants? Why can't we see our children in the same way we see the tomato and pepper as they sit side by side? We need to. Their potential growth are our work, and with the right supports, an abundant harvest, our promise to keep. And there is the book. It's a, it's a short book that's taken a lifetime and a master's degree to write. Um, it's a simple story. I think it tells an important story um, that will help it really, it's not a book um, for kids, it's a book on behalf of kids who, um, who struggle in any way and the adults who are around them in helping roles. And really, um, what I hope this book can do is seamlessly and gently uh, redefine all helping relationships um, uh, from a strength-based point of view where, um, where we can all become strong um, because equity uh, allows us to uh, succeed based on our merits. And, um, I, you know, it's my hope that it, it makes the world a better place. So thank you for listening. Matt, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, are there questions in the in the chat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, bef I have lots of questions for you, um, but I also want to just first just thank you. I mean, I think that when we have conversations about um, environments that like the goodness of fit between the environment and someone's needs, like determining like how they do. Sometimes no one has thought about that for humans, but like thinks about it all the time for gardening plants. Like, anyway, so I think it's genius. I think the analogy is genius. And um, I, I really, really, really appreciate this. Um, I know that, um, you maybe um, did you did you have did you had questions for, for us also, right? Well, uh, I was interested actually in hearing from you um, the science um, around the well-being of people who are neurodivergent. Oh, 
Um, I was interested in hearing from you, Mel, about, um, you know, the impacts on people. Uh, um, you know, my story is about creating a foundation for success. Um, but, um, you know, equity, as I've learned across my life, is not an easy request. And I think it's because equity doesn't necessarily counter what's illegal or blatantly wrong. Um, a request for equity challenges simply what is. And, um, and when somebody seeks equity, very often the systems around them, um, whether it be family, schools, employers, the gamut, um, a request for equity um, becomes almost the fault of the person that's requesting it. And because it, it our brain is a, is a simple um, machine on some levels. And one of the simplest things our brain struggles with is change. And so any perceived change that, um, that threatens what is um, sends everybody on some level into that fight or flight and um, and it and it makes moving through the world more difficult. And I think I said to you the other day that I wish, you know, I've come to a point in my life where I understand that um, the strength I have has been realized because of the struggle I've moved through. And I said, wouldn't it be a nice world if we could all develop that strength um, because of equity, based on our merits? Um, I think there'd be a lot fewer, you know, scars along the way. And, um, but the reality is that's not the world we live in. And, um, um, you know, I was hoping, you know, some of that science, some of those statistics behind um, what people do experience um, as they move through a neurodivergent life in a normative world. Um, and I would, you know, I was thinking that would be a nice way to support uh, the notion that the book describes. I can totally do that. I'm going to take the laptop and I'm going to come back to the floor. I feel more grounded on the floor. Let's right, go. Okay, here we go. All right. Now I can see, kind of. Okay. Um, so I think what you're really referring to is when we think about how one in, f oh, I guess I should sit here. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to not turn my back to anyone in like, three different directions, which is hard. I can turn my back to the tree. Anyway, um, you know, one in five people thinks, learns, or communicates differently than the so-called typical brain, even though, like, that's not really a thing. And it's really just that there's, like, the assumption that there's a one-size-fits-all life, even though there's n not one type of brain. Like, there's this infinite number of ways in which our brains do things. But for these one in five people who like, whose brains significantly depart from this, like the, the, the type of brain that society has deemed most desirable and that most things cater to, like, like w the difficulty accessing everyday life is substantial. And the, the poor, like let's even think about um, the, the experience of a young child whose play looks different than uh, the so-called typical play. And so play is the pursuit of joy. Um, like only a person can decide what brings them joy. And yet um, many kids are given the message that their interests and that the things that give them joy is fundamentally flawed and broken and needs to be fixed. And then the messages that come from healthcare providers or mental, you know, and, 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 and you know, including doctors, mental health therapists, all other kind of teachers, like just sometimes there are the expected defaults of like what kids do. Um, well, you know, you're, you know, uh, you know, you're a, you're a big girl. Um, you know, you should be able to, you should be able to do X, right? Like as though, as though there's a default brain, you should be able to do things or that there are 
um, like like things that are attributed to like laziness when we're really talking about executive functioning differences. Um, this 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 is common. So neurodivergent kids from very um, early ages are getting the message that and and you know that that the, the we're effective over time that really takes a toll um, and when people are either forced to hide their true selves to fit in or to not be found out um, or any anything like that that takes its toll on mental health so neurodivergent kids experience more bullying experience more anxiety and depression experience um, uh, more uh, just everything more and here's just a, a trigger warning um, even in neurodivergent kids, higher rates of suicidal thinking. And especially when we think about the intersectionality of all of the different ways in which people are marginalized and othered. You know, when we think about um, the, you know, known relationship between neurodiversity and gender diversity and sexual orientation diversity, like all of these stack the deck of invalidation and othering. It's trauma, toxic trauma of being made to feel like there's something broken about you. And then we make it to adulthood. And let's even when we're when we're even more talking about when we think about autistic adults and the Average life expectancy being age 36 to 54 years um, and not dying from autism, but dying from premature cardiovascular disease and suicide. So toxic chronic stress from growing up in a world that's not designed for you. These are the consequences. So the other thing I'll say is that risk of suicide in autistic adults is also um, this risk. So it's nine times, four, four to nine times increased risk of suicide in autistic adults as compared to non-autistic adults. And we're also thinking about the fact that those rates are higher in those with lower support needs, um, uh, which in, and, 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 and separately research showing that um, suicidal thinking and completed suicide highest in those with, with who, who've, who've felt pressure to mask and camouflage and hide their true selves. So really, I think this is a really long-winded answer to your question, which is that the brain science is that there's no right way to be a person but yet there are messages from society that there is a right way to be a person and that this has an enormous toll on physical and mental health. You know, and I, I have some observations. Oh, oh, we have one question on the, oh. but you oh, yes. finish what you were saying first. Oh no, well, and I just have some observations from my own life um, that, that, you know, match up. But yes, what's the question? Yeah. Um, we have one question, definitely lots of people saying, what a wonderful book. Um, I love the analogy and how you build on it. Great message. Thank you, Matt. The one question we have is, um, would Mike please share more about his metaphor regarding if we leave them in the dirt, it is our fault? Hmm. Sure. Um, because um, children depend on adults. Um, they, you know, the adult in the child's world is their beginning and their end. Um, it's their, it's their, um, their literal survival. And um, life, I, I'm not, I'm not um, here to blame parents or schools. Um, I'm not here to say um, that it's somebody's fault. Um, what I am here to say is that, um, 
so often when kids are challenged in some way, um, the world around them tells them that something needs to be fixed. And I'd like the question to, um, to change and shift from what do we need to fix to what help can we give you? And, um, and that's basically, it. you know, I, I, I understand I was born in 1971. I think leaded gas was still legal. Lawn darts were still a good idea. Um, smoking might still have been healthy. Um, there was so much that people didn't know. And, um, and I was born with a, a long set of challenges. I was born at 28 weeks. Um, I caught uh, bacterial meningitis. Um, I had a shunt put in when I was four months old. I've had a total of 30 surgeries in my life, 19 of those neurosurgeries. Um, five of those were two summers ago. Um, you know, I've been neurodivergent my whole life, but only was diagnosed with a learning disability at 40. And um, I got accommodations for that learning disability, and I got a master's degree. So, you know, um, potential is tied to support. And, um, but very often our brains, operating the way they do, um, you know, we see something that's not in the norm, we see something that's different, and, um, part of our brain goes to that place of, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or flock. And um, it's easier in the world we live in to modify the child uh, than it is the environment. And so, you know, so much comes down to cost. Um, but when I, you know, when I talk about cost, and I'm going to do something that I don't do very often, I'm going to take off my glasses. Um, these glasses, by the way, um, they don't help me see. Uh, they, um, they help balance my perception of, of everything I experience. And uh, so I wanted to give a shout out to the Mind Eye Institute because they um, do work that uh, changes um, uh, neurodiverse people's lives every single day. But um, I don't take my glasses off a lot because I, I see them, or I came to see them as a mask, something that would shield me um, from a world that's been commenting on what I look like or how my face is shaped for my entire life. And, um, you know, that's when, when we're talking about impacts on kids, um, things that are different draw our attention. It is, it is absolutely natural and okay. And it's part of the way we uh, survived for millennia. What I've come to understand that the, the impulse to notice is completely healthy and innocent. Um, what our brains then do with, um, with what we notice um, can be less than kind. You know, I've been, I've been teaching people about who I am in relation to my experience since I was very, very small, four or five years old, getting asked by an adult in a grocery store, you know, what's wrong with your face? And I had to come up with an answer. Um, one of the most, I guess, eh, I learned a lot about myself in the moment. I, had, I was about 30 years old and I was uh, driving through Bethesda, Maryland, and I just rescued an inchworm off my leg and deposited it safely on a, on a branch. And um, I got back in my car and I was driving and these kids, probably, you know, 18, 19 years old, they, they stopped at a red light next to me and they rolled down their window. And I thought, oh, they need directions or something. Well, too bad for them, I don't live here. So I rolled down my window and I said, can I help you? And the kids said, yeah, tell me what's, uh, tell me what's wrong with your head. And I said, and I said to them, um, well, I was born this way. What's wrong with yours? <laughs> and and then I then I drove um, to a side street and I parked my car and I cried. Um, I was a grown man, but these messages have been coming to me and at me for my entire life, and it's because I simply look different. Um, the thinking different. Um, was added on top of it. You know, I was 40 years old before I found out that I was, um, that I could be a hard worker, that I could achieve, that I wasn't lazy, that I wasn't not smart. 
um, you know, those are the messages that the world sends to neurodivergent kids. And we're focused on neurodivergence, kids who are different in any way. And, you know, my, my nickname in, in first grade was Egghead. Um, but I forgive kids because kids don't have any perspective in terms of their experience. Um, everything is new. Everything is foreign. So when in a child's environment, when something is out of the ordinary, man, they focus on it like a laser. And, um, you know, this, this is the life I've lived. And, and I've gotten to a point and I've done the work where I'm absolutely grateful for the experience because everything I've gone through has made me the person that I am. And I like that guy. So these days I take off my glasses with a little more ease. And, uh, you know, I'd just like people to know that really just lead, lead with what you value, lead with kindness. And when a kid comes to you and they can't explain what's happening in their experience and you can't understand it, don't think automatically that it's a problem with them. Find somebody to give you another point of view on what, what's happening for them. And that way they can move through life uh, based on what they're good at and what they love. And um, that's where all the good parts of human development come from. So um, that's, that's the bigger picture about this book. Um, and, uh, you know, I just hope people get something from reading it. seven-year-old who's listening who um, said paraphrase this book as being about balancing a balancing act for brains because the tomatoes need something to climb like kids have needs like they need to drink water that's amazing I love how kids think about things they think without rules they think without the boundaries that eventually get installed and um, you know, it's why they're, you know, some of my favorite people, because um, they're not yet aware of what people think isn't possible. And uh, that's amazing. My five-year-old um, is, when, whenever we watch a movie where there's a, you know, a villain, um, Recently, she shared, Mama, I don't think that villain is a bad guy. I think they're just angsty. Amazing, right? Like, um, uh, or, and, and so, you know, we'll watch, car you know, cartoon characters, like, common everyday kids' movies, and comment, like, huh, um, this is how this is, and the, the other characters are kind of judging in this way, like kind of neutrally observing that this, this is what goes on. And Luna will be like, they shouldn't do that. I'm like, I know. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's really the younger that we can teach young kids that we all have different brains that learn, think, and communicate differently. You know, even typically developing kids in my practice, like I, they'll say something and I, I don't want them to think the way they do something is the default either. So I'll say like, you know, they'll, they'll make some comment like, Oh, look what I did with this thing. And I'll say, Oh, isn't that interesting that your brain did this? My brain thought about this. And there was a kid this morning who thought about this other thing. Isn't that interesting? We all have different brains because that, that message, like I didn't learn that until I was like 35 years old. Um, and, 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 and really what, what happens a lot when you don't, so sometimes it comes up um, where the family of a neurodivergent child will say, well, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not going to tell my kid about their brain. I was like, um, please tell your child about their brain. Like everyone needs to know about their brain. Um, and it, it's really when a child is not provided an explanation for what they are observing and the feedback they are receiving from the world 
they make one up. And the narrative that a young child creates is usually a narrative of like, I'm broken, I'm defective. Um, and so the earlier that, you know, that, 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 that anyone can learn about, you know, this, this is how I'm wired and these are my access needs. This is what I need to participate in my world. I'm, I'm wondering, um, and I can, I can, I can start with the folks here. Um, like, how, how, how is this message playing out in, in your lives? What have you seen or thought about? Um, so you both kind of talked about the standards that we create to classify people as normal or abnormal, um, which made me think about some of the tools that we have. Um, to screen people and you know identify kids who need more support. Um, so how do you balance identifying kids and creating systems which which can put more supports in place for those kids without othering them? That's a great question. I mean, we are especially when we think about young kids and school, for example. Um, in 2022, you can't readily receive accommodations for your to achieve your access needs without having some kind of diagnostic label like that is that yeah because because really um universal design offering things in flexible multimodal ways like that would be preferable that that is supposed to be the gold standard but we don't have that and so right it is it is absolutely a, a, a balance um, as far as um, uh, screening tools I think that the the screening tools that are out there for example um, like if I just think about autism for example um, you know screening tools diagnostic criteria they are based on stereotypes they're based on um, autistic stress behaviors and so the more dysregulated someone is the more likely they are to receive an autism diagnosis um, as opposed to recognizing like modern day brain science like knows so much more about autistic nervous systems know about monotropic attention systems of fewer things captivating our interest at a time and doing some more intensely than other brains we know about sensory processing asynchrony we, we, we know about these things but they're not even part of the criteria but the stuff that's in there they're stress behaviors um and that and 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 Sorry, I have the kind of brain that when I hear motorcycles, even though they are nowhere near me, they are, they may as well be like the, you know, right in front of me. Anyway, by the way, that language, I have the kind of brain that X, I use that all day long. Um, and at first, you know, when I first started talking like that, before I even knew I was autistic, um, like it, it, it felt funny to me. But very soon thereafter, I realized that it had no adverse consequences to me. Like, it was really just, oh, okay. Um, and it's just, like, normalizing these conversations. Um, you know, I have the kind of brain that loud sounds are, like, really bothersome. Or I have the kind of brain that, you know, fluorescent lights give me a migraine. Like, these, these kind of basic sensory experiences turns out when you normalize talking about it people talk about it and it's not that bad um you just it takes practice and when we can model that for little kids that goes a long way like when i hear a sweet little love like a patient of mine like using my i have a brain script like oh, my soul melts it's just so magical because like they're gonna be okay um what was I saying before the motorcycle? In our culture of interdependence, Sears, my external working memory. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. I have the kind of brain that feels like somebody's stabbing me in the brain with a screwdriver. Right. Um, anyway, um, I think what I was talking about, access needs, anybody? Oh, oh, oh the stress beat, oh, 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 yep, thank you. That was super helpful, thank you. Um, culture of interdependence. And I would actually, about that, um, I think that for young kids, K 
kids get the narrative that like independence is so glorified as like the thing that you're striving for. Um, like, like, like as though it's bad to rely on other people, right? Like that's, oh, like just when you think about like the, the subtle yet profound messages that are sent, like that is, that's, that's, that's a big one. Um, oh, you know, um, you're, you're ex age, you know, you should be able to wipe yourself by now, or you should be able to sleep by yourself now. Like I'm a, I'm a grown adult. I really prefer to sleep with my husband. Like, I don't like, it's like, at what point is it like, like that, that you like get over wanting to sleep side by side with someone, you know, like, so just, just kind of normalizing that stuff too. Like we, we all co-regulate with other humans. Um, but about the, about, uh, about diagnostic criteria and stuff, like in my practice, um, most of the late identified neurodivergent adults, you know, autistic, ADHD, dyspraxic, like all the various neurodivergent diseases, people present in chaos and crisis that is often the impetus to first do the, like the, start the process of coming to understand and learn about your brain. So like, wouldn't it be better that people could learn about their brains with outreaching chaos and crisis? Like that would be, I think we'd have like a way better, way more comfortable world. Um, but, 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 but often late identified, um, or late diagnosed autistic adults, for example, um, present in something called autistic burnout, which is, um, a, a, a profoundly dopamine deficient state with an implosion of executive functioning. It's like the consequences of being profoundly dysregulated and losing the ability to mask, which is a, 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 a significant cognitive load, um, that really takes its toll on a nervous system. And that's often how, how, how people get their autism diagnosis and it's certainly how I got mine. There's a question, uh, there's a comment in the chat. I've started using that terminology regularly too. I have the kind of brain, et cetera. It's empowering, although I think I'm speaking Klingon to everyone around me, even well-informed and caring um, and that just don't get it no matter the explanation. Yeah, I think it's just practice. I think it's just, yeah. So, you know, thanks for, thanks, thanks for naming that. Um, but, but I, I, I think it is just, just practice. And, um, and a lot of it, you know, I, I, I definitely can say that, um, I, I have, it's a privilege that I live in a world where I, I, I have a lot social capital. I have autonomy. I did have to quit my job to achieve that. Um, but like that, that is something that when you don't have that, it ends up not always being safe to show up as your true self and like just to to name that and honor that like your limbic system decides when it's safe to do something um but what i what i what i would also say is that um uh, neurodivergent kids um often um not not always because we you know it's, it's it's certainly not a homogenous group but but many times those with um sensitive neuroception systems so threat detection systems um often kids who don't feel safe in certain situations and name that to their grown-ups are often invalidated are met with, oh, you know, be a big boy, you can go do the thing, or what are you talking about? It's fine, go do the thing. Um, so, and then why are we surprised when kids lose the ability to trust their intuition? So we have adults that feel unsafe and end up in relationships or situations that are unsafe. Um, you know, objectively, subjectively, whatever it is, it's not safe and don't trust themselves to leave um, because got messages that like, you know, your interpretation of reality is not valid. I wonder if anyone in Zoom world has any questions. Oh, there is a question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um. We have another question. Given that most educators would completely agree with the message of Mike's book, 
what's to explain the gap between them and students getting what they need in school and other social services. Here's one example of which I am most familiar. Half of students read below grade level, but only a small percentage. Whoop. No, I'm scrolling. Um, sorry about that. Um, only a small percentage receives specialized services, and oftentimes these services do not actually lead to learning gains. What are the disconnects? And we also have a question, where's the best place to buy a copy of your book, Matt? Oh. A link is going in the chat. Um, it's Book Baby. <clears throat> um, so school is, a, is an incredibly complex environment. I worked as a paraeducator at Barry City Elementary for uh, five years while I was in my master's program, which took me six years, which is twice uh, the normal length. <laughs> um, but it makes sense because most accommodations that are given um, involve increased time. And, um, you know, I um, teaching is one of the hardest jobs there is. Um, the convergence of, of, you know, social pressures and, and everything else. And, and every child comes from a different experience. And then they walk into this environment that is supposed to teach them. And, um, um, you know, th so the question about kids and their, their different reading levels, you know, um, the thing that I saw, um, working most effectively, and I think all the best science around education uh, talks about this right now, it's sort of the, um, I won't say sort of, it is the hot topic, but that the, um, the best indicator of uh, positive outcomes in educational settings is the relationship between the helper and the child being helped, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a paraeducator, um, um, or any school staff. And so, you know, because through education, um, we learn um, about, uh, you know, with the relationship we learn about each other and, and in that learning, um, you know, maybe, maybe the gaps are uh, more exposed. But at the same time, I also admit, if you've got 25 children in your classroom, you know, how are you supposed to do that? So, you know, I think this is just part of an ongoing conversation. Um, and it's interesting to me that the, um, the science around psychology and education, you know, that is the place they agree. The, the um, largest indicator of any positive outcome is the relationship between the therapist and the client or the, um, the helper and the child being helped in school. So, you know, I would just go toward doing everybody doing their best to deepen those relationships um, because that's where that's where struggle can be identified and um, and the strength that comes along with it um, can be seen too. I would also say, because um, I don't think I could make it through a brain club without saying this, um, but there's also a lot of brain rules in all systems. So like, um, uh, for those who have not, not heard me um, talk about that term before, um, so like brain rule, a thing that we think is a universal life truth, but we really made it up or someone else made it up, and then we, or like someone who trained us made it up, or the someone who trained the person who trained the person who trained us made it up. Anyway, it's still not a world rule, like a law of physics or something. Um, so, sorry, it was the motorcycle thing again. Um, but like a brain rule, like, well, um, oops, did, did Zoom just crash? Did I just lose Zoom? Something just happened, yep. All right, hang on. We can still hear you, Matt. Oh, that's great. Then I'll just talk. I don't need my Zoom. Great. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, so, one uh, uh, maybe about four months ago, I went to one of my patients' IEP meetings, and um, the, the the topic came up that you know so and so is unable to, um, you know, is not motivated because they like can't, they, they, they just can't do the work. Um, and 
I found myself wondering, like, what was the work? Was it being delivered in a way that worked for the kid's brain? Did they understand? How were the directions of the assignment given? Um, were was that in a way that worked for the kid's brain? Like, it's just the the there's the brain rules of like, well, well, kids, you should just tell them what to do and they should do the thing, as opposed to recognizing that, you know, if you have the kind of brain that is taking in so much extra information, um, you you. It's, it, can, it can be very hard to auditorily process information, um, sequence the steps, retain it in working memory, and then, like, anyway, and, and then, oh, and by the way, like, some, th some, some other competing stimuli, you know, just came into my awareness. And, and so just as though there was one way to do a thing and that there's, anyway, these, there's a lot of, a lot of brain rules um, or... Um, you know, uh, you know, so and so should be able to. Sh Any time that we hear like so and so should be able to do something, that is almost always a brain rule, um, because that's again the assumption that there's one right type of brain. example from my own life and again uh, not anybody's fault but um, I just recently discovered that I'm cross dominant um, I always knew that I was but I never knew the name for it and it means that I write with my left hand and I um, like play tennis uh, right-handed sports different things like that and um, I can't write with my right hand um, when I was a kid um, kindergarten I remember this was my first um, encounter with with the world that you know didn't understand me and uh, I, I wrote with my left hand, so in kindergarten they gave me left-handed scissors, which I couldn't use to save my life. And um, I remember going to the meeting with my parents, um, with my mother, I think. And um, we sat there and we talked with the teacher and it was a real concern that I couldn't cut a straight line. Um, nobody, nobody thought to give me right-handed scissors, but when I had the scissors, um, uh, I don't cut a great straight line, but I did way better uh, with my right hand than I did with my left. And so, you know, again, you know, a problem is identified. Um, uh, the brain uh, goes to that fight or flight, you know, oh, we've got to figure this out. And, um, you know, if I'd gotten the right hand, the right hand scissors, um, uh, there wouldn't have been a problem to begin with. Any questions from anyone here at the State House? Yeah. Um, well, hmm. I think Mel already answered, but just to verbalize it. Um, the question is, do you see this metaphor applying any differently to adults? I teach college age students and this feels just as relevant to that age group as in childhood. It feels like the same message across the lifespan. And Mel said, same oh, thing. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, like as a as a I teach medical students. And when I think about just the the ableism, like I, you know, this is, this is something that n no one talked about in, in my training and that like, I am super guilty of, of all of the things that were like attributed to lack of motivation, self-direction, sloppiness, like all this stuff that was, is really just about needing supports for executive functioning or, um, uh, you know, step, steps for motor planning, like all these things that are, are, are just really not not talked about, um, and in the chat, um, thank you, Shauna. Um, so, so, so helpful and new to me to think about the fight or flight reaction in the teacher, provider, caregiver. Oh, that yes. Um, so, you know, it, it co-regulation or co-dysregulation is it happens all the all the time you know it's happening in our in our homes it's happening in the classroom between you know teacher and student and student and student and like all the ways in which nervous systems interact and and especially if you know when I think about brain rules like brain rules and if if if, if um if you want to go back and find the when did I do that march brain rules world rules yeah maybe a march brain club on brain rules and world rules like we think about brain rules are a or cognitive self-regulation. I have so many brain rules and I make them up to make my world make sense. Um, so like a, you know, a quick example would be like, it's a, you know, we can't eat tomato sauce on the white carpet. 
brain rule, not a world rule, but like it's a brain rule that makes my world more orderly. So a lot of the brain rules in a classroom, if you've got 30 kids with conflicting access needs, so like we need to sit in our chairs, that's a brain rule, but it like, it's trying to resolve chaos and it's still a brain rule. What do you want to say? No, no, I was just, I was smiling at the, um, and I don't remember what I was just saying. Well, well, two, two, th maybe like, I don't know how many thoughts happened in between, but if you want to say something about applying to older learners, like young adult and adult learners, I think that's, you started talking and then I interrupted. No, I mean, you know, those, those stories, I've got those stories too. I, in, um, in undergrad, I failed, I don't know. For, I failed like three different foreign languages five different times and because it was it was small pieces being added onto um, uh, larger pieces which were the other part of the words and my brain just couldn't do it and I remember Latin was my special my special nemesis and I remember sitting there and and I was you know 20 and my Latin professor just looked at me and just was like why can't you learn this and um, because Latin, um, I think from a, from a normative standpoint is, is a learner's dream because it's all on a grid. <laughs> and um, so, but my brain just doesn't do that. And uh, that was 1993-ish. Um, so, you know, um, there's still more work to do to, um, to help people feel comfortable in their efforts um, to learn about their world. And, and I like to think about um, Lev Vygotsky, um, I can't remember, he was alive maybe in the 1800s, but uh, um, a Russian uh, psychologist and he developed a, a scaffolding theory on education where, where the adults in the, in the learning environment, their job was to help children move from what they know to what they're about to know. And, um, and I think that overall, that connection, that, that scaffold, that ladder, that assistance, um, is is a, a good place, um, and this I think applies to any system where well, every system uh, has moments where learning occurs, and if we can broaden the notion of what learning looks like, um, maybe it will feel differently for those people who m need it most. Um, it also makes me think about how, um, as a as a parent, I've had a had to unlearn like a lot of brain rules about what it means to be a parent, also, and like what it's going to look like. And I like I thought I would have a five and a half year old who would like be going to a school. And that's not what's happening because that is not what her limbic system has decided is safe for her right now. And oops, hold on, Laura got bumped back on. Um, and so, like Matt, what you said about like re like recognizing all of the places in which learning takes place is really, really important. Um, oh. Um, it looks like I'm, I've, I'm frozen, but am I like an unexpected? Um, so my five-year-old, I thought that I would have, um, you know, I'd be the parent of a kindergartner who attended kindergarten in a, in a school, but that's not the child that I have. The child I have, um, needs autonomy at all times. And when you tell her what to do, she has a limbic response. It's automatic. It's involuntary. It, it just is. Um, and so what she needs is different. And so earlier, um, pre-tech pre situation, Matt made the comment about um, how learning can take place in all different settings and, like, is happening in every day-to-day -day life. Um, and, like, that's, that's what unschooling is for us um 
uh, like today, we, um, we, we, we went out, we had a snack, we had, um, we had, we were, we were discussing, like, we were doing, like, content analysis of Disney movies and, like, talking about keys to the universe, and then, like, uh, we ended up having this, like, really interesting historical conversation about Marsha P. Johnson and, like, all of this stuff that, like, I never thought I would teach my five-year-old even. Like, it was it was way cooler than anything I think she would have learned at a school. So, anyway, brain rules. I think it all comes down to, like, deciding which ones are helpful and replacing the ones that are not. Anyway, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, and and um, when I send out the recording, I'll also send a link out to your book. Because I think that, you know, we, speaking of brain rules, like, people don't like to have their brain rules challenged. So when you share a, 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 a disarming metaphor about something so, like, irrefutable, like, it, it I think, really makes a... Uh, the point. Some people have told me they grow their tomatoes without cages. I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if, if in Zoom land, um, if you could hear Matt's comment. Did you hear did you hear the comment about the tomatoes? Matt said that some people tell him that he grows that they grow their tomatoes without cages. Um, and I'm not a gardener. So I don't even know that. Is that like a sacrilege to do? Yeah, I don't know either. Anyway, I grow, I, like I, I just kill all my vegetables because I don't take care of their environments. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming. And um, next week at Brain Club, neurodiversity and employment. Um, we are going to have a variety of panelists next week because um, because on past Brain Clubs we've had a lot of um, neurodivergent folks talking about their experiences with employment, what's work, what's not work. We're going to hear from employers next week um, of, uh, sh of, of 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 what the process of um, learning about neurodiversity and access has 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 been for them. So um, uh, thank you all, and I hope to see you next week.